Good morning. It's wonderful to be at your place again today. You know, today we're starting a brand new series. It's based in the book of John, chapters 13 through to 17. And we've called this series Uncommon. Now, I think you would agree with me that our world is not the same as it was. And while no doubt history and time will see the disruption of COVID relegated to, to lessons learned, like all disruptions right now, there are some things we do need to learn. And it's true not only in our society, but also in our church. And so we'd do really well in this time of disruption to ask some pretty deep questions of ourselves. And as a church leadership, we've been challenged by the question of whether we really are a disciple-making church. And, to be honest, whether we are the sort of disciples that Jesus envisioned. You know, to be discipled is to learn from and align yourselves to. It's to be taught and to follow someone or something. Now, I want to tell you something right off the bat. Every single one of us, we are brilliant disciples. You see, the question is not whether you are a disciple. The question is, what kind of disciple are you? And I say that because every single one of us is a learner. Every single one of us is putting into our minds and putting into our hearts the things that we're thinking about, the things that we're pondering, the things we're watching, the things we're reading, the things that we're engaging with. You see, all of those things disciple us. And if we're truly honest, as Western Christians, we're far more influenced by the market and the media than we are being crafted by the one who created us. And we think this is a challenge. We think this is a, a moment for pause, a moment to think, a moment to change. So we're diving into the Bible where Jesus prepared his followers to change the world. He teaches them, he equips them, he provides for them, and he prays for them, and he prays for you, and he prays for me. And he leaves them with an uncommon definition of discipleship, one that changed the world and that continues to change the world that desperately needs changing, as do we. You know, we learned a couple of weeks ago from Adam Barr's message, and if you didn't catch that, I encourage you to go back onto the website and find it. It's a great message. That change happens from the inside out, not the outside in. And this series, Uncommon, is going to help us discover how that change occurs and what it looks like. So we're going to start from John chapter 13, and if you've got a Bible, I encourage you to open it and read along with me. We're going to read 17 verses from John chapter 13. Let's go. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress. And the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, You do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord Simon Peter replied, Not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, 
you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. Let's pray together. Father, as we explore this passage of Scripture this morning, I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would illuminate truth to our soul and you would find in us people who are receptive to be crafted, to be a disciple that you're calling us to be. Father, I ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Saviour. Amen. Jesus is in those final moments before he's about to be betrayed and ultimately end up crucified on the cross, buried in the grave and then obviously rising again from the dead and ascending to heaven. This is the last moment with his disciples where he has a chance to teach them. And what's really interesting is he knew, it says at the beginning of that passage, he knew that his hour had come. Now what's interesting about that is this, this is the reason why he came. You see, he didn't come to teach. He didn't come to heal. He didn't come to be a moral example. Jesus Christ actually came to this earth to die. And if all Jesus is is a great teacher or a great leader that we can take example from, we miss the whole purpose of his life. He came as a savior to sacrifice himself in our place for our sin. And so this is his hour. This is his moment. And in this moment, it says here that having loved his own who are in the world, he loved them to the end. It literally means he loved them without limit. He poured himself out. It's like you can imagine a cup. It's he literally poured all of himself out. There was nothing left of him as he gave himself to his disciples. You know, these disciples were around a table with Jesus and it's not a table we'd have in a, an ordinary Kiwi kitchen it's a low table and they would have been reclining leaning on their left elbow and their feet sort of going back from the table and in front of them there would be the food the meal I'd be eating and as they're sort of leaning on one elbow they'd reach in they'd grab their food and they'd eat together this was how they they did community this was how they gathered together now there was a there was a table filled with people and oh, there was a whole bunch of agendas on that table. You know, just around this passage, as you read through the Gospels, you find that the sons of Zebedee um, had been asking for the best seats in glory. They were wanting the prime place. There was this competitive spirit in the disciples. They were all asking each other, well, who's the greatest? Who does Jesus love the most? Who's the, who's the most important one? They were thinking of themselves. Peter was convinced that he had all the ability he needed to follow Jesus and was quite proud of that fact that he would never betray Jesus. And Judas had already checked out. And through a series of compromises, he was primed and ready to betray Jesus to the authorities. And Jesus, knowing that all things were under his power. It's interesting, isn't it, when you think of the complexity of what's around that table, that Jesus had all things under his power. I wonder what you'd do in that moment. I wonder what I'd do in that moment. I wonder if I would take the time to call out the challenges I wonder if we would confront or I wonder if we'd try and push it under the carpet. And there are a whole lot of options we would have and Jesus in fact had and, and he could have turned around and begun to lay out a strategy because he said, look, you've got to get this competitive spirit under control because I need you to build an organization called the church. He could have given them a strategic plan for how they were to take the world. He could have trained them as leaders. He could have got into their heart and said, you know, as a leader, you can't have these attitudes. You've got to be more uh, forceful. You've got to be more proactive in your leadership. And he could have had a great leadership lesson for them. But he didn't. He wanted to make disciples. He wanted to make disciples who would make disciples. He was instilling in them a new world view. He was centering this worldview on abiding with Jesus. We're going to get to that in John 15. He was bringing them to this place where they would not get caught up with all the things they needed to do for Jesus. Rather, he invited them to dwell with him. 
and for him then to work through them. There's such a powerful difference. You see, this was an uncommon way of learning and an uncommon way of living. And so he starts with this collection of people with all of their faults and failings and foibles and um, dreams and passions. And he does the unthinkable. He gets up from the table and he takes a towel and he wraps it around himself and he gets a bowl and he fills it with water. Now, this would have been a shocking moment because, you see, back in those days, they would, they would have worn their sandals as they were walking around the, around the streets. <clears throat> and as they came in to eat at a table like this, as you're leaning and your feet are going out, the person next to you, your feet are going to be somewhere close to their head. And that's all okay for those of us who have uh, shoes on. But these guys would have been walking throughout the, <clears throat> the town of, of Jerusalem. And as they did that, uh, there was all sorts of stuff that they would have collected on their feet. You never know where the dog had gone or the camel had gone or even just some rubbish or scraps that people had thrown out onto the streets. And it's highly likely that their feet would stink with not particularly nice smell. And so what would happen normally in the house is that a servant, while the people are reclining, a servant would take a bowl and would take a towel and would wash their feet. But no servant did it this time. We don't even know why they weren't there. And so there would have been this unspoken conversation going on because they all knew that that hadn't been done. But nobody was prepared to go and pick up a bowl and wash the other person's feet. Because if they did that, what they would be saying to everybody else around that table, I am lower than you. And remember, they've all got their visions of grandeur. Nobody wanted to be the lowest. And so here in this moment, as Jesus is preparing them, his first, his most profound lesson was to say, you know what? If you think you're the greatest, let me show you how to do it. You serve. And he picked up the bowl and he went to the first one's feet and he washed their feet and he dried their feet and then he moved on to the next one. And as he did that, he started to clean them. Now, Peter, of course, in the story, who always uh, comes out with a great statement, he said, no, 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 Lord, you can't do this to me. He's embarrassed. You know, he's probably thinking, maybe I should have done this, but no, I didn't want to do that because then I'd be seen to be low. So he's in an absolute conundrum. He has no idea where to go. And so Jesus says to him, well, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. And so then Peter overreacts. And firstly, he says, don't you dare do this to me. And then he says, well, if you're going to do that, you might as well do the whole lot of me. And Jesus says, no, no, I just need to do your feet now. The rest is clean. And later on, you'll understand why. Well, after Jesus had washed all of their feet, he sits down and he says, do you understand what I've done for you? And he asked them, you call me teacher and Lord. Interestingly, he puts it that way. He says, you call me teacher. In other words, what he's saying to them in this moment is, you're getting attracted to me by what I'm saying and that will lead you to follow me. And then he flips it in the next verse, verse 13. He says, you call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so for what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, he flips it. He says, you know what? If you're going to follow me, firstly, you need to know that I'm your Lord. And I will teach you out of my Lordship. So what he's saying to them at that moment is, I don't need to prove myself to you by my teaching. I'm calling you to follow me. Follow me and I will teach you. There's a humility in approaching it from that way. I think many of us look at someone who is a teacher. In fact, many of us even look at Jesus and we look at the Bible and we say, well, you teach me first and I'll weigh up whether I think that's good or that's right and then I'll follow you. Whereas an uncommon discipleship, a Jesus discipleship, is firstly to say, you know what, Lord, I'm coming to you and I will follow you. What you say, I will obey such a different way of focusing on it. And then he says, now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, so you should also wash one another's feet. Now, this is where it gets interesting because I don't see throughout the history of Christendom 
this consistent movement of us getting bowls and getting towels and washing each other's feet. I mean, how many times have you been to a church service where you've walked in there and a whole group of people have washed your feet? Some of us maybe once or twice for sort of a, a special illustration. And yet Jesus' command here, right after he said, do what I say without, almost without question, he says, now, as I've washed your feet, you should wash one another's feet. What does he mean? Well, as he said to Peter, do you understand what I've done for you? And you see later on in the Bible, the penny drops and Peter gets it, as do the other apostles. As we walk through our lives, we are as followers of Jesus, and I'm talking right at this moment about people who have given their life to Jesus Christ. Now, if you're listening to this and you haven't, uh, this is a great moment for you to actually you almost get an inside peek on what it means to be a follower of Jesus. You see, as followers of Jesus Christ, we are clean. When we surrender our life to Christ, we appropriated His sacrifice for our sin. And all that separated us from God, Jesus took and paid for, and we received from him a righteousness, a positional righteousness that we have in Christ. And that is wonderful. That is amazing. But here's the challenge that we continue to walk in our lives. We continue to walk through this world. And just like the dirty streets of Jerusalem, we live in a fallen world, a fallen society, where sin can get caught under our feet. You know, it, it could be uh, just a sin, of, a sin that we do. Maybe it's a sin of selfishness. Maybe it is just a brokenness that we have. Maybe it is a sin where as we think about it, um, we're actually falling away from where God wants us. Maybe we're lying. Maybe it is sickness. Maybe it is defeat. Maybe it is discouragement. Yeah, I wonder what sin has kind of wrapped itself around your feet. Well, what do we do with that? Now, a few weeks ago, I went to a friend of mine and uh, he and his wife had just bought a new home. And Sarah and I, we went there and we were wandering around. I was wandering with uh, my friend outside and, and we were wandering around. And then we went to go back inside and I had one of those horrible moments where I looked down at where I was walking and I realized that behind me, exactly where my feet were stepping, was dog poo. And... I then looked under one of my feet and sure enough, uh, they have a dog, uh, I had planted my foot in a nicely freshly formed piece of dog poo and was about to traipse it inside. Well, if that wasn't bad enough, I looked under my other foot and I'd managed to accumulate some uh, dog poo on my other foot as well. So that left me in that horrible situation. What can I do? There's no way I'm walking inside uh, to you know, ruin their nice new carpet. So I took my shoes off and I walked around outside and I left them at the front door. And I thought, I don't want to embarrass them. I don't want to let them know. I'll, I'll, I'll walk inside pretending like nothing's happened. I'll just walk around in my socks. That'll all be fine. And then when I get to go, I'll pick up my shoes again with all their dog turd on them. I'll put them in the boot of my car and I'll drive home and I'll deal with it later. I think we do this with sin. And Jesus is calling us to an uncommon community where we will wash each other's feet. Now, I wonder what it would look like for you to walk into a situation, to walk into a community of people where they would humble themselves to wash your feet. I see this probably most profoundly, to be honest, in our marriage. And there are times when uh, I will just be having one of those bad days, <laughs> quite regularly, and there's an attitude which is coming out. Maybe I'm being a bit short with Sarah. And as I do that, it's like I've got sin stuck to my feet. And just like the dog turd, it stinks. And it stinks out the relationship. And it just makes it not work. And it's unpleasant. And who wants to be around that? And yet Sarah will lovingly challenge me. She'll come up to me and say, yeah, are you having a bad day? What's wrong? Here's what you're doing. And in that moment, I could do what Peter did. I could say, no, 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 don't wash me. Don't, get away from me. I don't need this. But I do, really. Or I could say, actually, I'm going to humble myself. I'm going to allow you to wash me, not by what you're saying, but by God's truth. And there's the key. You see, as we come together as community, 
We wash each other with the word. And this is what Paul said in Ephesians 5, that there is a washing by the word of God. You see, to, to wash something off, and you know it as well as I do, if I've got dirt on my hand, I can pick up this water and I can rub it. And after a while, it, it nearly comes off, so I get some more soap and I rub it again, then maybe a third time, rub it again, and eventually it comes off and then I can dry myself. You know, it's true with the Word. It's true with washing of water by the Word of God. I think the vision that Jesus is creating here is for an uncommon community where there is loving, serving, washing. That people come together and they love each other so much just as Jesus loved them. That when the, the stench of sin is, is observed, that they don't push it to one side. They don't say, well, we're not going to go there. But rather they lovingly come around and they say, allow me to wash you with truth. And the challenges for both the washer and the washee is to humbly submit to this incredible, uncommon discipleship. You see, you and I have this constant challenge and this constant battle. We all sin. We all get things wrong. We all have attitudes we bring in. And you know what? The challenge, if we really were doing this, would be that we could either choose to be offended and to draw back, or we could choose to humble ourselves and allow our community to wash us. And you know the amazing thing, if we all did this, if we all had this desire to be washed by the Word, how much better our community would smell how much better our life group would smell, how much better our families would smell, how much better our marriages would smell. I wonder if in, in your circle, where you are now, and for those of you who are married, I wonder if there is some undealt with patterns of behaviours or sins or attitudes which are causing issues. And maybe today this is a moment for you to say, I'm going to pick up the towel and I'm going to serve and I'm going to humble myself and the person then being washed is going to humble themselves as you come to the truth of God's word and you allow it to transform your life. Imagine that in every sphere of your life, the transformation that there would be. So this is the beginning of our Uncommon series. And it starts with this incredible invitation to adopt a posture of serving and of washing one another with the word. And it does it with this passionate desire to see other people clean and walking in a whole way. So I wonder where you're at. I wonder if that's been something which has just resonated in your heart. And I wonder if there was someone that the Lord is prompting you right now to actually to go and talk to, to wash them with the word. And if you're someone who's not yet following Jesus, you've just had a sneak peek into what it means to follow Jesus. And you may have thought, well, I just thought it was like come to Jesus and everything is good. I want to tell you, it is an invitation to an uncommonly difficult yet incredibly freeing walk of life. Yeah, may God bless you this week as you apply what you're hearing in His Word. Let's pray together. Father, we thank You for Your Word. We thank you, Father, for the truth of your word. I pray, Father, we as followers of Jesus would know what it is to humbly serve one another and to wash one another's feet. So, Lord, as we turn our attention from here into our week and into the daily uh, duties of life, I pray, Father, that your truth would transform us. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.